who is no stranger to KCU. He is an alum of this school. And before I go on to say more about Dr. Calabrese, I also want to introduce another alum of the school, Dr. John Smith, who is here from Wichita. Dr. Smith uh, was a general surgeon for many, many years and now is retired to head the board of KCU. So I would invite you all to join me in a round of applause for Dr. Smith, thanking him for the work he does on behalf of us all. And thank you for coming up for this. Uh, Dr. Calabrese is here from the Cleveland Clinic where he went uh, after graduating from KCU some years ago. He focuses on rheumatology and immunology, especially has done a lot of work and is known internationally for his work on HIV and hep C. Uh, focuses also on diseases of the vascular system. Dr. Calabrese uh, holds two chairs at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including humanitarian awards. He is a humanist in addition to being a, a physician. And uh, one of the major projects that he's working on now um, is around empathy, a huge project, research project that includes this campus and uh, all of the DO uh, campuses around the country, I believe. He's gonna talk to us something about that as well as um, uh, mindfulness, uh, humanism in medicine. I would invite you to uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Calabrese. Good morning. So um, it's really great to uh, uh, be back here. Uh, uh, very flattered to be able to try to contribute uh, to this series um, in bioethics. So, you know, first of all, a little truth telling. Um, uh, before I started this, I was telling Terry beforehand. I, um, I. Uh, at our medical school, at the Cleveland Clinic, I run uh, this thread. Uh, it's called Human Values, and it includes bioethics and reflective practice and medical humanism and things like this. And I was drafted to do this about 12, 13 years ago. And uh, it was a new medical school, and uh, somehow uh, I was dragged into this, and I said I had absolutely no expertise in this. I'm a immunologist that does translational research on molecular aspects of immunology. And uh, uh, I didn't want to do it, and I told them no. And uh, they bugged me and uh, tried to make me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I said, well, first let me kind of look into this whole area. I, I, I don't really have any expertise. I made some calls around the country to um, schools that I thought were uh, exemplars of uh, what this should be, and I asked them how they taught this humanistic aspect of medicine. And uh, it only took a few minutes to tell that there's really no one way to do this, and uh, I'd be allowed to experiment. And over time, it's become a, a, a kind of a avocation for me. So um, I, I think that this is an, an extraordinarily interesting area, and I, as I say, I'm flattered to be here to do this. So today I want to talk about these topics, these words, and I'd, I'd really like to have you kind of interact with me. I know it's a big class here, but we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about this notion of empathy. We're going to create some definitions. I mean, is it just a word that you know, we, we talk about, or is it something that we you know, aspire to? Talk a little bit about the scientific correlates of empathy and uh, what's relationship to things such as burnout. And finally, I really want to turn this, talk about this in an osteopathic medicine way and ask the question, is there anything unique that we have to offer or to think about in terms of empathy as we move forward? So empathy is an interesting topic and 
it is uh, very hot right now. On the one hand, you know, who can argue with empathy? I mean, we, we, we all aspire to be empathic. And I don't know, if you've ever been sick, and people in your family ever been sick, and you go to the doctor, you know what you're looking for here. You want extraordinary care, but you want someone who actually also cares. Uh, so that's easy. On the other hand, empathy as a scientific topic is very complicated. Hard to get your hands on it, you know? There's no biomarker that's reliable for empathy. And uh, this Paul Bloom, this, this social psychologist, uh, this book is uh, fairly new in the past year um, and uh, takes some academic swats at empathy and uh, it's kind of gobbledygook stuff. But uh, just to make the point that there's room for discussion and engagement in this. Uh, so let, let, let's, let's, let's dive into it as we go along. So there's a hypothesis that I have that empathy, resiliency, and mindfulness. And I'm really not going to be able to talk too much about mindfulness today, but uh, uh, at the end, I'll make some comments. Um, uh, this package of qualities can lead to better care and better caring in medicine. So if that's a hypothesis, how do we go about proving this? How do we, how do we go about studying it? So there's some challenges here. Um, I will start out by saying, can the osteopathic profession, in the form of its colleges, this being certainly one of the finest, and we think the finest, uh, can we contribute meaningful, meaningfully to the field of empathy research? And I don't mean empathy research in osteopathic medicine. I mean empathy research in the healing arts. I think this is an extraordinary opportunity. I'd like to hopefully at the end of this get some of you fired up uh, to go into this. Um, secondly, can the osteopathic profession, let's narrow it down, um, can we make empathy, including research into its nature and, and uh, its involvement in education, can we make it a cornerstone of the process of medical education that you're in and a premier aspect of its practice. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to look too far. The osteopathic profession always talks about being uh, holistic and humanly driven, all right? So this is like where the rubber meets the road. Can we actually do something in this area as opposed to talk about it? So this is my first day slide. I give us, I have the privilege of giving the first day of the first year students at the at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. And I show this all the time. And this is, this is the business of medicine, right? This is what you're here for. So you are second year. You're in the middle of this tumultuous process of medical education. And there's two pillars going on here, technophilia and philanthropia. Technophilia is, you know, that's kind of the exciting part. It's the hard part. You know, it's everything that's going on in medicine from, you know, it's basic science, it's molecular science. Some would say it's the deconstruction of medicine. Um, you know, we're now in an omic world and you have to understand big data and machine learning and um, uh, trying to take all this in is like, you know, drinking from a fire hose and you're thinking about step one and step two and um, it is all-consuming. You could never get on top of it. You can never be ahead of it. You're just always trying to catch up. At the same time, this other pillar is all the other stuff. And certainly it's bioethics, but there's much more. And we, we'll just call it medical humanism. You know, if I say better care, I said better caring. You know, maybe the care and the quality and the outcomes are on the technophilia side. Let's just say the caring is on the philanthropia side. 
it's not like something, you know, think about it for a second. Uh, you can take a very simplistic view of this, say like, I come in here as a humanist. I come in here, I want to do good. I come in here, I know what caring is. I know what it is to be cared for. What can you teach me? Or what do I have to learn? That's a, that's a really meritorious question. We think a lot, but uh, uh, um, uh, we'll, let's, let's just try to develop that a little bit. So some definitions. Empathy. What the hell is this term that everybody's using and just throwing it out there? All right, so without Wikipediaing this, who wants to just give me some, ex get, reduce this to some plain English for me. What is empathy? Who's going to give me a shout out? The ability to understand someone else's feelings. So that, that sounds to me, uh, and, and a great start, um, something I keep up here, all right? I understand it. Sounds intellectual to me. Everybody buy that? Anybody want to add to that? Is, it, is this a cognitive understanding? I understand. Is that empathy? Or there, you want to take the goalposts and move them out a little bit more. Good start. Come on. I can be quiet for a long time, so this is not going to get easier. So it's just the understanding of someone else's issue. And being able to feel it yourself. So now you've added something more than just a cognitive thing. You've got now an emotional component to it. Feeling what other people are feeling. You're getting very close. Yes? And Thank you. And being able to communicate that back to the person. So now, all of these are correct. There's a cognitive awareness. Um, there is some feelings involved. But it's only good if you can give it back. I mean, that's the caring part. And at least that's what the, the patient will feel. So some definitions might say this. This is um, Dr. Hojot the developer of the Jefferson Empathy Scale and the principal investigator of the project on osteopathic um, uh, 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 medical uh, aspects of empathy, the PAMI study. He says, empathy is predominantly a cognitive attribute which involves understanding, understanding of experiences, concerns, perspectives of a patient combined with the capacity to communicate it back. And that's what, that, what it is. So let's just start with that as a, a notion. So this, w whether empathy is uh, cognitive and wh whether it's uh, 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 emotional is kind of over here. It, there's really, you can't separate these things out. I like to think that empathy at its sweetest spot um, is this area right, right in the middle here. Sympathy, on the other hand, is predominantly an emotional aspect. I feel so bad. I feel so bad for this person. It's a, a genuine feeling, but at times it can be deconstructive. Um, you know, you have to, you know, you, you, you can't perpetually um, be emotionally labile over other people's issues. You have to have it uh, together, this notion of emotional burnout. But Empathy, again, is not this kind of Vulcan notion of I appreciate that that person is suffering. It's I, I get it. So somewhere along this line, this is where it goes. And I, I think this is a great uh, diagram to uh, produce. 
suffering. Another term that we use a lot. So you guys are second years and you're doing all your histories and physicals and you have, uh, you know, you're getting that review of systems down like crazy, man. You can do that, put it in the electronic medical record. It's pretty cool. So what's your review of systems for this? You have a drop down menu for that one? So let's think about this suffering notion. You know, some people have a problem uh, which uh, continues to amaze us as physicians, you know, that, you know, when I put on my rheumatology hat and I see somebody with a, you know, totally worn out knee and, you know, they come in and like, you know, they got this antalgic gait and all this stuff and I go like, hey man, what's, what's going on with that knee? He goes, oh yeah, it's a bum knee, just, you know, had it like that for years, it's like, you know, no big deal. Another person comes in and it's like, oh my God, you know, my, my leg is killing me and you're looking at it and you're just, you know, it's not swollen, it's not tender, it's not hot. There's a person here that is suffering and there's a person here who is not suffering yet it's discordant from time to time with their diseases and I'm not being pejorative, I'm just trying to make you understand this. So suffering is, a, is, a, is, a, uh, is something that is so important in medicine and something that we have to engage in. Um, so some have described this as this, this experience of helplessness that, that, is, that, that imparts fear to us over the future. So suffering with illness is a huge deal. You know, people that have had a minor myocardial infarction have totally recovered now are just incapacitated from moving ahead in their lives. Never going to move again. Can't do this. Um, discordant from this. So let, let's keep that notion in mind. The next term is compassion. You know, these are words that, you know, you, you know, I don't know you're going to see them on step one or step two, but they are very important. When you talk about compassion, what's the difference between having empathy for someone and having compassion for someone? What do you think? Do you think of them separately? Think of them as the same. Person's really compassionate. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe compassion is empathy and action. Empathy and action. Matter of fact, that's an extraordinarily good definition, um, and and I, I like that a lot. So our desire to relieve the suffering of others. So a compassionate person is actually doing something. It's not being, you know, this cognitive person or just feeling it, but moving ahead to help someone. And, you know, how compassionate we are, I don't know. I mean, we don't, we don't really assess that um, uh, a, a lot. Healing. Healing and curing. Are they the same thing? What do you think? No, I get a big sh head shake. No. What's the difference? Give me an example of healing and give me an example of curing. I think there, I mean, there's a lot of diseases that are chronic processes that are going to cure someone of, but you can get them to their level of health, like as healthy as they can be. And to me, that shows compassion to any health process to heal, but th if they're at the best of their their level. Their level. Anybody want to, I hope everybody could hear that, 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 that it was an excellent uh, um, summary of this. We'll say to make people whole, all right, to make people whole again. And, you know, people who I told you, the person who's had the myocardial infarction, they're perfectly, you know, their heart's working fine and they're stented and they're doing this, but they can't get back with their family, they can't get back with their job, they can't get back with their friends. You know, their, 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 their spirit is, is trashed. 
and you know you've sent them to the Cleveland Clinic and they've had the the stent and uh, you know their heart is as healed as it's going to be, uh, but uh, to make them whole again requires something else. So keep this notion in mind. This is all should be sounding fairly osteopathic uh, to me. So can we cure without healing? Yeah, I just gave you an example. Person stented, heart's fine, good ejection fraction, um, but this person is not healed. Can you heal without curing? I heard a yes. Give me, give, give somebody want to. Elaborate a little bit. How many think you can heal without curing? Raise your hands. Really? That's all? So this is, this is really an important uh, concept. And I mean, you have to think about it. And you're young and uh, you know, haven't done a lot of suffering. But people in your family might and people that you know. You know, there are so many diseases that we can't cure, whether they're chronic, poorly explained, medically unexplained symptoms, you know, whether it's chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia or things that just are at the boundaries of our understanding, or people that have, you know, terminal cancers. I just saw a guy yesterday that has uh, an anesthesiologist, just retired, has glioblastoma, and he's going to die from that. And this guy is about as healed as it could be. He had total partnering with his wife. You know, he's at peace with this whole thing. That is a healing track of an illness. And we do this all the time. You know, it's kind of like, you know, curing and healing. It's like, you know, you get your apartment ripped off or something like that. And even if you get your junk back, you just don't feel right. You know, this place just has been trashed and now it's back and I, I just don't feel, I don't feel the way I want to feel about it anymore. Um, uh, this is a challenge that we have in medicine. And so we've given some examples. So this notion of empathy, compassion, and healing. This is not new. This is old. This is goes. This is you know, Maimonides. Me, I never see a patient, anything but a fellow creature in pain. May I never consider him merely a vessel of disease. You know, healers have been saying this for for millennia. The great Sir William Osler, and everyone should, if you if if this if this is new to you. You have my, give my permission to Wikipedia, Sir William. Um, the greatest physician of the modern era um, who brought bedside teaching uh, to you and me and, and everyone else um, wrote so elegantly about treating patients. And even though he worked at a time when there were very few medications, he recognized that you know, great physicians treat the disease, good physicians treat the disease, but great physicians treat the patient. So he, he made all these observations um, um, and embodied them. And we still, we still, there are Osler societies on every continent in the world, uh, essentially. And um, uh, we still honor his um, uh, notion. Um, Francis Peabody, the Peabody Society, uh, which is still alive and strong in Boston, uh, said that the treatment of a disease may be entirely impersonal, but the care of the patient must be completely personal. Now, some of you might be thinking, like, all of these platitudes that I'm hearing are things that I already know. So why the hell are we talking about them? Uh, because in medicine, somehow, as you know, 
we have a tendency to lose our way with this. And um, this is a good time to start uh, uh, talking about the science of this. The most famous quote is, the secret of patient care is to care for the patient. I, that really says the whole thing. So, all right, so now let's go talk about this uh, as, a, as a discipline. So empathy uh, actually is a subject of uh, health science research, and there are both qualitative and quantitative measurements of this. And as I said, it's, it's a little bit difficult. You know, I can't order flow cytometry for empathy, but there are some uh, highly validated instruments that have been used to um, study it. And these uh, instruments have demonstrated that physicians who have higher levels of empathy, however they got it, tend to have lower stresses themselves, has been correlated with higher quality care, at least in some studies, not all, um, definitely have enhanced professional satisfaction, um, improved outcomes, um, and not surprisingly, patient satisfaction. I mean, this is big. And, you know, in the big world of modern medicine, uh, where we, you guys know what HCAPs are? All right, so this is, this, is, this is a big deal thing. So what do we know about empathy? So this is a study just uh, came out in academic medicine uh, from our group um, where we looked at uh, the association between physician empathy, uh, physician characteristics, um, and measures of the patient experience. So this is HCAP type of data where patients in the hospital. So you guys haven't seen this, this study. So, so this is, I'll just give you the 30,000 foot view. This is so cool. So uh, we looked at 847 physicians in our uh, group. Um, 62 of them were osteopathic physicians. And we found, like other studies, that empathy um, correlated with female gender. No big surprise here, ladies. You're the winners in this area. And um, uh, it's just the way every study has always shown this. And you can think about it if you want. And people who go into cognitive specialties, uh, particularly primary care oriented uh, specialties, are more empathic. Now, what was lost in this paper, now this is, this is a, you know, a large study with a lot of sophisticated analysis. In the primary analysis of, uh, of, of uh, these multiple variables, the influence of uh, merely looking at uh, educational background was looked at. And that osteopathic physicians in our system, in the first cut of the data, had significantly higher empathy levels um, than their allopathic colleagues. And this was controlled for sex, age, type of practice, um, uh, zip code, uh, 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 the whole deal. Now, in the multivariable analysis, uh, this lost um, uh, its significance. But we were looking at so many variables, this is really not surprising. And if you understand the principles of statistical analysis of tests, um, uh, you immediately recognize that having a p-value of this level at the minimum means this needs to be further explored, all right? Whether it's 0.05 or whether it's 0.04, something at this limit or beyond um, is approaching statistical significance. So this is actually, you know, very few people have seen this data at this point in time. It's a high-impact publication. It's important. So. At the Cleveland Clinic uh, Learner College of Medicine, which is a research-oriented medical school where I, where I do this empathy work and give similar talks to this, there's a fascination between, you know, well, what is this empathy and healing, what's the, what's the biologic basis of it? What's the research basis of it? Is there this, or is this just making us feel good? And this is a study by a friend of mine, Bruce Barrett, um, uh, from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, they are leaders in studying respiratory illnesses at the University of Wisconsin. They established the standard scales for uh, colds and flus and things like this. And they did this fabulous study looking at the perception of empathy from the patient's perspective um, on um, the common cold. And they, uh, this is a consort data set uh, flow diagram 
basically looked at 700 patients um, that had common colds. I'm, I'm cutting to the chase of a lot of this. Qu met entry criteria for this. So you know in 14 days the cold's going to be gone, right? And so you had three different tracks. You had no visit at all. You just talked to somebody on the phone, nurse practitioner. Two, you came into the office and saw somebody who gave you a standard visit. Let me listen to your heart and lungs, go home, take some Tylenol, and you know, call me if it gets worse. Um, and a third visit, which was choreographed to be highly empathic. And they had professional actors training them. It was just all randomized. Um, in fact, when they went into the room, they would pick an envelope out, and you had to decide whether you'd be the standard visit or the empathic visit, and you had to change doing this. Um, so you have uh, this thing, and basically shows that you know those people who had the empathic visits um, uh, uh, had much less burden of uh, cold and flu symptoms statistically um, than those that had the standard visits or the on, uh, 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 the phone visits. And you say, okay, you know, I, I get this. This is making me feel good. I'd rather have somebody you know sympathetic to me. Uh, this is, you know, this is all within whatever you think about uh, placebo effects um, uh, to do this. But then th this is the most interesting part of it. So they took these three groups and they looked at a biomarker of um, uh, immune uh, integrity um, in the, in the uh, sinuses. And they looked at um, nasal secreted interleukin-8. And here you have um, phone visit, Standard visit, empathic visit. So the biomarker uh, for increased leukocyte trafficking, which we think is correlate of uh, integrated immune response in the sinus, was actually affected by the um, empathic visit. So interesting to think about that empathy not only uh, is on the feel-good side, on the caring side, but maybe on the care side. So if you think about this and you say, you know, it, it is assumed that we all come into medical school pretty empathic. At least that's what you told them in your interview, right? I like people and I'm interested in science. I think I heard that before. I don't know. Um, so we all start out medical school pretty high. So, you know, where, is the, where does this trajectory go? Does it like... Does it, does it go up? Does it go down? Does it go sideways? <laughs> I see a few elbows here. When does it go down? Second year of residency? Do I hear any other inflection points in med school? When? Third year? Now? So I, I, I'll show you a little bit of data. But I, I think the most important thing to recognize that you know, you're not, you don't have handcuffs on for this. This is not, you know, you're not uh, predestined for this. And there are probably multiple trajectories of this. But I will sell, tell you that for the most part, most studies show that the predominance uh, effect is that in the third year, the clinical exposure year, but traditionally, um, is when empathy starts taking some hits. Yet at the same time, I'll point out to you that one out of three students does not lose empathy. And I think uh, hopefully all of you are in the one out of three. And some of these, you know, fall apart like a cheap suit, and others are just kind of you know, taking a little bit of hit here and there. So what's that all about? Reasons for lost empathy. I, if I had a lot of time, and I mean, this is really a talk that I like to give over three or four sessions. But, you know, hidden curriculum. This is uh, also in the Annals of Internal Medicine, just this past issue, uh, a task force, the American College of Physicians have talked about the importance of the hidden curriculum. Everybody know what this is about? You know, you learn all this stuff here and you're, you're engaged in this and the first rotation you go on, you're exposed to man's inhumanity to man and, and this is not the way that you learned it and this, this occurs. Um, things are, you know, medicine is so stressful because 
much of what we do is not under our control. Uh, you know, there's work to be done. You know, two sick people come in. You can't ignore them both. Time pressure, volume, um, patient and environmental factors. I always say to the students and the residents, it's really easy to be empathic to nice patients. And the, the, the flip side of that is it's often very difficult to be empathic to people who wouldn't be your friend and you wouldn't want them to be your friend. So that's uh, the deal. And then finally, the influence of technology. There's a very famous um, uh, editorial from the New England Journal of a decade ago by Abraham Verghese. Uh, hopefully you're all reading um, uh, uh, some works of, of, uh, of uh, fiction and humanism uh, while you're still going to medical school right now and so busy, but uh, talking about the influence of taking care of the eye patient um, where we spend so little of our time at the bedside and most of our time at the, uh, um, uh, uh, in front of the electronic medical record. And then people have made observation that, you know, when you get to be old like JP and I, um, somehow um, empathy goes up. Why do you think that would happen? More stuff is happening. More stuff is happening. Yes, more stuff is that just like we were talking about that guy. Uh, and I said, you know, that unfortunately, uh, many people interpret this as you have to have a near-death experience to be empathic. It's actually not true. Uh, but um, uh, there, uh, the very famously, um, uh, Kubler-Ross, who uh, eponymously is associated with so much um, uh, in uh, understanding death and dying, said that, Suffering, nothing is a faster teacher. And actually, it's been exploited to actually techniques to build empathy, trying to learn what it is uh, for patients to go through things. So interesting. So now, let me wind up uh, with uh, talking about this osteopathic connection here. So this is, uh, up until now, this is the same Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine Empathy Symposium. Um, uh, nothing different. This is this is this is uh, going to be a little bit different here. So burnout um, uh, uh, as an introduction. Everybody knows what burnout is. Uh, there was a, just a uh, New England Journal of Medicine article this current week, um, looking at a randomized controlled trial of fixed hours versus flexible hours um, in uh, house officer training. Um, and uh, uh, looking at the influence of, you know, all these rules that you'll be subjected to in your residence. But the sub rosa of that study was is that uh, they did um, Maslach burnout scales on all these uh, residents. And uh, uh, these are first years, and 75% showed signs of significant burnout. That's, that's, that's unacceptable, and, and um, uh, it's an important article, and you should do that at a journal club. Uh, burnout, you know, everybody knows it when you see it. When you see somebody burned out, it's a person who's emotionally exhausted. They're not enjoying their work. They're not taking the pride in their work that they should. It's depersonalizing, and um, uh, 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 it is to be avoided. There's nothing more deflating than uh, seeing someone who's uh, burned out and not being able to help them. I've given you some data on prevalence. The causes are the same type of things that, uh, you know, cause us to lose empathy. Um, um, and there's a, a race going on right now in modern medicine trying to figure out what are personal things you can do to reduce your chances of burnout and what the institutions where you go to work, what their obligations and opportunities are. And so that, that's all happening. And I think that there's some great um, uh, 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 things happening and hopefully you'll benefit from them. There have been some great studies in this area. Um, this is a study from the University of Rochester who have been pioneers. Uh, Ron Epstein uh, is uh, one of the co-authors. He's a leader in um, mindfulness and medicine. He's just written a new book called On Doctoring. It's a fabulous book, by the way. And they did a, a, a very carefully done trial. This was published in JAMA um, uh, uh, about eight years ago. It showed that if you took primary care physicians and exposed them 
to exercises in mindfulness meditation, narrative writing. They would get together every week and uh, write small stories about what their experience has been and exchange it with each other, and something called appreciative inquiry, where we actually tell each other stories about what our experiences has been when we're working at our best. Tell me what, you know, tell me those stories. Not learning from your mistakes, but learning from when things are really clicking, you know, how does that make you feel? And this was a very, very positive study. So I, I just show this to you for this. So now segueing to this issue here is, and I've been asked this question many times, and I've given you this little provocative uh, bit of data. I said, is empathy the same uh, in DO medical students as it is in MD medical students or in practitioners? And I, my first reaction to this is that um, that's probably not the right question. So let's ask the basis of, you know, what is this osteopathic medicine thing that we're doing. You know, if I walk in to that last lecture, I'm listening to it, I could be at Case Western Reserve or the Learner College. It looks like I didn't see anything osteopathic to me. So, you know, what the hell does it mean that we're here in this, in this institution? And I think that there are a lot of things that, that osteopathic medicine is really, this is a definition from the AOA website um, about our philosophy this integrated philosophy of, of, uh, uh, of uh, this holistic view of, of, uh, of individuals. And that in itself um, is not new. I mean, Andrew Taylor still you can go back, you know, a century ago, but there are other medical humanists. How many of you ever have uh, heard of Eric Cassell? Have we read anything of his? You don't count, Terry. You can't do that. Um, do yourself a favor and buy this book and just keep it. And uh, I, I've read this book so many times. Uh, Eric Cassell is one of the giants of medical humanism, member of the National Academy of Science. Um, he's in his 80s now and redid this book that he had done many years ago and has written so elegantly about suffering and compassion and humanism. And when I read this the first time, I said, this, this sounds like it comes from osteopathic medical schools to me. He says, he says, first realize that sickness occurs in the whole person. Because whatever happens to one part of the person happens to the whole. And he emphasizes this like so many times. He said, think about it. It, it can't be any other way. This is, this is the way it is. Now, this is, this is one of the great deans of medical humanism and National Academy of Science um, uh, 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 awardee uh, talking about this holistic approach to this. So now you come back and say, okay, well, you know, maybe this, this, this erstwhile philosophy of ours um, uh, you know, is, is more widely resonant. So maybe we should be asking this question, are, do we have different empathy? Uh, do we have a different trajectory? Are there things contributing to this? And I say, no, it's really not what I am in this empathy research space for. What I am here is I want to know about empathy in educational settings such as this because I want to make contributions to the knowledge of empathy and compassion and healing in all of medicine. So if we have something, if we're doing something good, or at least have that potential, then we should share it with everyone. That's, that's what we want to do. So we have this big, there's a lot of PR campaigns going on about empathy and DO professions and this, and there's my buddy Mike Finley, and I, I, this is all good. I like it. It's nice. But, you know, show me the money. You know, there's a saying in science, the data are the data. So show me the data that we're more empathic. And we have an opportunity to do that. I've already talked to you, the third year, the devil in the third year, as Dr. Hojot says. Do we have a devil in the third year in osteopathic medicine? There been a couple studies that have examined it. One says, not much of a loss of empathy at all. The other says, looks just like an allopathic school. 
And when I think about it, and I was talking um, to Dr. Hahn and Dr. Smith today, you know, I would be astounded if all 50 million DO schools had the same pattern of empathy as each other. You got medical schools in New York City, and you got medical schools in Alabama, and you have uh, state schools and evangelical schools, and you, you got, it's, you know, how, how monolithic are we actually? So that's a, that's a, a meritorious question to, to ask. Um, there's a lot of strengths um, uh, to these type of data, but there are weaknesses. So far, it's only been cross-sectional. That means measure empathy in class one, two, three, and four, and then try to make some conclusion. Well, if they're all the same, well, then nobody loses empathy. Well, not really, because the, the, the ideal study is to look at people serially, right? So what happens to you over four years? Do you go down, et cetera? So that's to be done. So we have this project that you are all um, uh, 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 entreated to participate in, and I'm here to make the strongest case for you when you get this uh, opportunity to do the, have you, have, second year class, have you done this yet? Have you done the JES scale? Have you been asked to do it? I can't even, first years have already done it. You'll be getting this before the end of the year. Um, it takes you 10 minutes to do the JES scale. It's all anonymous. It's a free kick at the ball. Um, we have 41 campuses participating. We're going to have tens of thousands of students. This will be the largest biorepository of empathy data ever collected in a medical setting on the, in the, on the planet. And all you have to do is just uh, speak with your heart and, 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 and do the JES. It's a great first step. So this is the cross-sectional study of empathy um, in osteopathic medicine. But where we'd like to take this moving forward is to uh, do this serially. Uh, and that will require you know, uh, uh, a lot more in terms of uh, IRB clearance, buy-in of students. We want you students um, to be participants in this. Uh, and that may be coming in the next few years. This will cost a lot of money. And it's an opportunity for the osteopathic profession to make a dent in this. So as we talk about empathy, let me close by saying a couple things. Um, no matter how you feel about this, I, I hopefully, hopefully no one's arguing that this is not important. So there's two roads to empathy. If you don't have time for this, you don't have the emotional wherewithal to do it, you can do this. This is called etiquette-based medicine. This was uh, published a, a decade ago in the New England Journal. It says, OK, at the minimum, I don't care how bad you feel. I don't care, bad, care what kind of creepy feelings you're having today. You can do this. When you go on your hospital rotation, you know, knock at the door. Introduce yourself. Um, show them who the heck you are on this team. You know, make some bodily contact um, uh, with this person. Sit down at their eye level. All your advanced communication things coming into this. Uh, explain your role here. I'm the medical student, man. I, I am here. You have my, my, my ear, my time, and my voice. And it's a lot more than a lot of physicians have. And then ask them how they're feeling about being in the hospital. That's the bare, that's the entry fee, OK? But there's more. And there's words that, that you don't use, at least. At least is an anti-empathetic term. You know what I mean by that? It's like, you know. I really was counting on getting this promotion. I had the interview. I didn't get the job. And you tell me, at least you have a job. Or the, the couple who comes in to discuss their miscarriage. At least you have a healthy child. That is not empathetic. My husband died. At least you had 30 years with him. That's bullshit. Empathy is, is never using terms like this. Empathy is based on relationships, actually understanding people, and, 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 and being able to relate that. 
this stuff, this is your advanced communications. This is where the reality of this, you're not learning advanced communications to get through an OSCE. You're learning advanced communications so you can actually transmit the caring part of your relationships with your patients. This is so important. So you could be really empathic inside and cognitively, but unless you can show this to somebody, it's not helpful. And so, you know, these, these, these views of, of, of true, genuine um, um, uh, conceptual empathy are so important. So empathy is dynamic. And uh, I, I will also tell you, I'm going to give this shout out to Adrian Boise. Um, uh, this is a, 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 a book on our advanced communications course that every single Cleveland Clinic physician is mandated to go through eight hours. And we've put 5,500 physicians through this. Every house officer has to do this. And it just basically, it is our ready model, relationships, establish, develop, and engagement. Um, and it basically is the philosophy that every one of us, old guys like me, we can still improve our advanced communication skills. We can do this. And it, it's a constant process. We need coaching. And um, this is so pot. Every, nobody wanted to do this when it was established 10 years ago. Now everybody says it's the best thing that we ever did as a system. Um, and uh, uh, this talks about the ready model. And if you can't do that, we say, just start acting nice. <laughs> and ultimately, you know, good things will happen. Now, lastly, I'm going to close by talking about what genuine empathy is. And uh, you, see, you see this in the hospital. And one of the things that one of my pet peeves in the hospital um, is that you're an intern, you're a student, and you're going down the hall, and you're by the intensive care unit, and there's a family out there having their darkest night of their lives. And you, you can see this. And how, watch and see how many times doctors come down, they're kind of telling jokes, and just walk right by this. You can't do that. You can't do that. There's a, there's a, human, there's a human aspect going on all the time. So anybody know who Don Berwick is? He was the, he's the ex-head of Medicare and Medicaid. So I'm going to read this for you. I have a couple minutes left. And um, I, I, I'm sure that Terry has heard this many times. And I read this every year to our students. So at any rate, this was a graduation ceremony at Yale. Uh, Dr. Berwick's daughter was graduating from Yale. And he was the head of Medicare and Medicaid at the time. And he said he got a letter. And gave, uh, this woman gave permission to do this. So this, this, this encapsulates everything that we're talking about. My husband was... Uh, Dr. William Grzynski, psychiatrist for 39 years. He was admitted to the hospital after developing a cerebral bleed in a hypertensive crisis. My issue is that I was denied access to see my husband, except for very strict visiting hours four times a, uh, a day for 30 minutes, and that my husband was hospitalized behind a locked door. My husband and I were rarely separated, except for work. He wanted me present in the ICU, and he challenged the ICU, saying, She's not a visitor. She's my wife. Mrs. Grzynski continued, I'm advocating to the hospital administration that visiting hours have to be open, especially for spouses. I do not feel his care was individualized to meet his needs. He wanted me there more than I was allowed. I felt that this was a cruel thing to do. Cruel is a powerful word for Mrs. Grzynski to use, isn't it? Her email and the emails that followed that first one are without exception, dignified, respectful, and tempered. Why does she say cruel? We'll have to imagine ourselves there. My husband and I loved each other very deeply, she writes to me, and we wanted to share our last days and moments together. We knew the gravity of the illness. Um, we wanted quality. We didn't want quantity. What might a husband and, and wife of 19 years, aware of the short time left together, wish to talk about, wish to do. 
I don't know for Dr. and Mrs. Grzynski, but I know for me, I'd want to talk about our children. I'd want to talk about the best trip we ever took together, even argue, smiling about those ideas. I would remember the black bear we met in a clearing at the St. Elias Range in the cabin uh, that we shared together. And he goes on to describe a number of these. They would be the visitors in this corner of our lives, talking about the healthcare workers, the doctors and the nurses. They, not us. Someone stole this all from Dr. and Mrs. Grudzinski, a nameless someone. I suspect an unknowing someone. Someone who did not understand who was at home and who was the guest. Who was the intruder? Someone who forgot about the black bear and the best mushroom soup that we ever had, that Jules shared experience, the glimmer of meaning in our lives. Of course, it isn't someone at all. We don't even know who or what it is. Its voice sounds rational. Its words are these. It's our policy. It's against the rules. It would be a problem. It's in your own best interest. What is irrational is not these phrases. They seem to make sense. What is irrational is what follows from those faces. It's our policy that you cannot hold your husband's hand. It's against the rules to let you see this or let you know this. It would be a problem if we treated you on your own terms and not ours. It is our own best interest, uh, in your own best interest, to miss the, the moments of your daughter's birth. The voices of power. And power does not always think the whole thing through. Even when it has no name and no locus, power can be, to bar borrow Mrs. Grzynski's words, cruel. And he goes on to offering this celebration of graduation um, and, and, and calling people to reflect on this. This is a, 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 a brilliant, I have, often have a hard time reading the whole thing uh, through. But it's really the reality of what we're talking about here. And um, so here's what many people are talking about right now in terms of empathy growth. If you're really interested in this as a group, and I'm sure you have you know, study groups and medical humanism groups and people who are thinking about aspects of your um, Professional development, reflective practice are huge in empathy. Um, telling stories like this story, in incredible. Um, starting groups uh, to uh, discuss empathy and compassion. Um, faculty development um, uh, and role modeling um, uh, going on at a, at a higher level. Begin early in training. Use literature in the arts, and I know you have an arts program, and literature, fiction. Samuel Shem says fiction is our friend. Practice the skills involved in differentiating empathy from uh, sympathy. So osteopathic opportunities, unplumbed right now. You do OMM and you're doing all this stuff, but what is the power of touch? What is the role of OMM in empathy? I actually think this is one of my hypotheses. I think that um, there is a physical closeness that osteopathic physicians have to patients that allopathic students um, have a hard time learning. And it comes from this early experience. It's a hypothesis. It needs to be tested. Um, we need to explore the uh, successful habits of, of, of master osteopathic physicians. Um, and uh, incorporate uh, uh, appropriate educational initiatives in this, and definitely expand research in this. Um, things that can be done on a medical campus like, uh, such as this, I don't know if anyone is doing mindfulness meditation. I don't know if anyone is doing any type of narrative uh, writing, uh, clubs, uh, arts and medicine, all these things are going on. Empathy can be measured very inexpensively. Uh, with qualitative uh, measurements. You just need a mentor, uh, uh, and you have uh, many uh, gifted uh, people here that can help uh, this type of research. It's uh, low cost, um, uh, modest amount of time, and very high impact. So I'm just leaving you with some tantalizing thoughts at the end. Um, and 
I'll open this up to any um, uh, questions here. Uh, I think we're kind of pretty much out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Calabrese. Um, I would just, on mindfulness, this morning I was on uh, LinkedIn. Dr. Hahn had posted a, a link to a, uh, a interview that Dr. B. Wright gave for Channel 4 on mindfulness and meditation. So uh, Google that and, and look at that. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Questions. Yes, Mr. Oh. 